Hello and welcome back here to Inside the Vault, a Carolina Panthers podcast episode number eight. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and uh, we are brought to you by the Keep Pounding Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at kppounding underscore FSSN. And this podcast also powered by the Fans First Sports Network. Follow them on Twitter at Fans First SN. And finally, you can rate and subscribe to the Tobacco Road Sports Radio YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash tobacco radio. Well, my latest guest here on Inside the Vault needs no introduction, but I'll certainly give him one anyway. He is a uh, WBT Radio Hall of Famer, the color commentator for the Carolina Panthers on the Panthers Radio Network for um, a long time now, since uh, the 1990s. Um, and he is one of the best in the business. Follow him on Twitter at Jim Zoki. Thrilled to have him on one of the premier voices of Panthers Radio, Jim Zoki. Jim, how are you? Doing great, Ryan. How are you today? I'm so good, sir. It's so good to have you on. Let's uh, just go ahead and get right into it. So talk about the preseason uh, games versus the Jets and Giants so far. Um, from a bird's eye view, what have you seen from this 2023 edition of Carolina? Yeah, I think kind of as advertised and what Frank Reich said, it would be that they're they're not clearly not showing a lot as far as scheme and uh, and playbook and those kind of things, and more focused on evaluating their players, the one on one matchups that they're having and so forth there. So I think um, you know again, I know the the fans would like to see probably you know, more, but I think they're trying to save that and not reveal that with these coaches all coming from different teams. Uh, a lot of new players in free agency in addition to obviously bringing in Bryce from Alabama. So I, I think that that's their goal is to try to get the work in and they do it on the practice fields and maybe don't show as much in the preseason games. But uh, I thought when Bryce has been out there, when the starters have been out there, uh, they, he's, been, he's been solid uh, as far as just you know, doing the things that are expected of him for just throwing the ball 12 times in two games. And uh, obviously everyone would like to see more explosiveness uh, from the offense and that'll come I'm sure during the regular season, uh, but for now we're kind of just in a, holding and waiting to see what it looks like. Yeah. You mentioned Bryce Young. Um, what have you seen in training camp? You've seen some preseason games, uh, OTAs, that sort of thing. Um, what's the best trait, lack of a better word, that you've kind of witnessed from him specifically? Do you have any concerns so far? And finally, it was. I think it's good that we saw him take some hits, especially in that Jets game, and he's able to get right back up. Obviously, you don't want to see that in the regular season too often, but it's good that he can at least take a few hits. I think, you know, to me, he just seems very calm. I don't feel, feel like it's too big for him as far as – college to pro so i mean he's in there with guys who played in this league for a number of years in most cases guys like adam thielen and hayden hurst and so forth and some offensive linemen so to me i think it just looks like you know he's ready for this moment to be an nfl starting quarterback you know most uh players who are not you know really high draft picks get to sit and wait uh, and at least you know several games several months several years in some cases you know he's being asked to come in and be the starter right away and it doesn't seem too big for him so i, I think that's cool and I think his resiliency, like you said, taking some shots and things like that, he bounces back pretty quick physically and uh, stature wise, I, I think um, doesn't bother him that much. So I think he's able to handle all those things to come with the physicality of football, learning the playbook, all those things you'd expect uh, him to be able to, to absorb, which is a lot at the NFL level. So it's a complicated scheme when they run it all. So I think uh, it's not seemed too big is probably my biggest comment about him. Yeah. And um, some corresponding moves that happened in the last 48 hours. Panthers signed corner Troy Hill from the um, previously of the L.A. Rams. Very familiar with Jonathan Cooley, quarterback's coach there, and Jero Avera's system in the 3-4. And then the corresponding move, Marquand McCall um, was cut. And that's getting a lot of uh, action all over Twitter and elsewhere. So what are your thoughts on uh, those corresponding moves? And um, does that raise uh, the needle at all or concern level of anything? Because I think McCall, well, it seemed like to me have a safe place on this roster. At least a lot of people thought that. Yeah, I think, you know, with him, I think the emergence of Raquan Williams probably has something to do with that. Uh, he had a sack, he had a quarterback hit, a couple of tackles in the last game. So uh, I think they like Raquan and what he can do. And uh, he is a lighter body defensive tackle, so a little bit more agile. So uh, again, what fits their particular scheme in terms of what they want agility wise? I think probably worked in favor of uh, Raekwon and not so much for Mark Quan as it turned out in this <laughs> move yesterday. So, um, but uh, Troy Hill, I asked Frank Reich about that at Panther talk on Monday and just a veteran guy, as you said, already played in the Jero Averro's system when he was the secondaries coach uh, in, in LA with the Rams. Um, so there's a familiarity there. And I think especially at the beginning of the season, 
you know, a guy like that who's like 30, 31 years old, who just knows how to play the way they need to play. I think sometimes you just need that where you don't have to coach and teach everybody, you know, someone who's kind of a little bit of plug and play uh, rotation depth at, uh, at corner. I think that's where Troy Hill comes in solid for them. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask this initially, so I'll pivot really quick because you just brought it up. Uh, Panther Talk last night, uh, we had, uh, as you said, Frank Reich was on there, Matt Corral, and then also Shy Tuttle, if I'm not mistaken, was also on there. Uh, for anyone who hasn't listened to that or um, hasn't had time to go back and see that, is there anything that you gleaned from last night's Panther Talk kind of heading into that Lions game? Uh, we'll preview that in just a second. You know, with Matt Corral, it's this is a great opportunity. Uh, they they know what they've got in Andy Dalton, even though he's new to the team. Um, but I think they want to see what is Matt Corral. Could he be a number two quarterback? Uh, you know, is is he you know just a three or is he a two? Obviously, Bryce is the one. So when, moving forward, you know, Dalton's here on a two year contract. But what does the future hold for Matt Corral? Since he didn't play at all last year, he's kind of a big question mark. So I think this has been a great opportunity for him. And then we had just shy Tuttle on and he comes in after four years with new Orleans as a defensive tackle where they played in a four, three. So uh, they, he said they played some three, four in new Orleans at times, you know, every team has their base and they, they shift out of other, other things, but he's, uh, he's happy to be here. Loves playing for a Jero Averro, um, likes being a Panther, went to North Davidson high school. So he grew up a Panther fan, a Julius Peppers fan. So I think for him, it's fun for him to be back home and, I know he's looking forward to Atlanta, obviously, first and foremost, but that second game against New Orleans on Monday night, I'm sure will be huge for him, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lots been made about Icky Aquanu uh, and the left tackle struggling against Kayvon Thibodeau and then um, also Quentin Williams in that first game. Are we overreacting to this at all? Uh, it seems like fans might be with preseason. Uh, or is Icky just that second-year player who is potentially going to be very, very good, but he's still a second-year player who's learning and developing even under uh, this new scheme? Sometimes you get beat. Uh, I think, you know, they mentioned in his last game, it was a miscommunication as far as what he thought was his assignment uh, that led to the, the sack last week uh, in the second game against the Giants. So Icky, I, I just look at the volume of his work as a rookie and it was very good once he got past his initiation with uh, future Hall of Famer, probably Miles Garrett. Yep. And Cleveland after that, I mean, he really settled in was was rock solid. So I think Icky is going to be one of the better left tackles in this league and is very good already right now. So people kind of tend to focus on a play or two. And again, the starters haven't had a bunch of reps. So yes. that's kind of what the body of work of what they have right now. But uh, I think for all these players, it's kind of hard to get into a rhythm when you're just out there for two series and you know, playing, you know, 20 snaps kind of is what it's been. So I think um, he'll be fine. I'm not worried about Icky Aquanu. I'm not worried about Taylor Moten. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see who ends up at right guard for a couple of weeks while uh, they wait on Austin Corbett to get healthy. You know, if it'll be Chandler Zavala and so forth, I, I'm not, I'm not worried about our tackles and there are times they're going to get beat. I mean, it just is really a lot of good edge rushers in this league and the giants and jets are honestly two of one of the better defensive fronts you'll face at any point this season. So those are good challenges and ones you'd like to win and get back. But uh, this is in the lab. This is the time of year where you may be working on stuff and getting better. Yeah. Uh, and, and as the old cliche goes, uh, those guys on defense get paid too. They're not paying for free. Right. So, um, Thank you, John Fox, for that. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> you mentioned right guard, uh, some of those preseason battles that we've been seeing. Uh, what other battles have stuck out in your eyes? You, Like I said, you mentioned Chandler's Vala there, right guard potentially for Austin Corbett. Uh, any other battles that you've seen throughout uh, that you're looking forward to seeing the end result come week one? I think the starters are pretty set for this team. You know, we mentioned obviously with Marquand going, it kind of, you know, it opens up things. I think they like Henry Anderson. I mean, that's another player that doesn't get talked about a lot. Uh, I think Henry Anderson in this defense could, could give some reps at different positions on the defensive line. So I think that, that it's kind of by committee with the interior defense. Obviously it's led by Derek Brown, as far as, you know, that the front of the three, four there. Um, it'll be interesting. I think as the season goes on to see who really, develops at receiver you know obviously i think initially adam thielen's that guy that's going to be the security blanket the good route runner the sure hands uh and that would be like one of my first looks if i'm a young quarterback say look in the direction of, of 19 adam thielen but i think you know dj chark has been the big play guy down at spartanburg uh, when they had training camp down there hasn't had much to do in these games so far but I th it'll be interesting to see if dj can be kind of the Ted Ginn role a little bit, the explosive, take the top off a of defense uh, and do some other routes. But I think he could be the explosive guy that opens it up. And I think we're all excited to see what Jonathan Mingo will do. Uh, we got a little taste of that when he caught the ball, bounced off the defender last week against the Giants, made a bigger play out of it after the catch. And that's the physicality of why you draft a guy like that in the second round. So I think, you know, Mingo, as the season goes on, can be counted on more. So maybe not as much right now. Uh, but as the season wears on and he gets towards the midpoint of the season, it'll be interesting to see where Mingo is in terms of just his development. 
Yeah. Um, let's talk really quick about this coaching staff before we preview Friday's game. Um, you know, previous regimes, uh, Rivera, um, we mentioned Foxy earlier, and then the rule regime. Um, this current uh, new staff under uh, Frank Reich, what's the atmosphere been like? What have you saw? What have you observed from this new staff? And, um, you know, a lot's been made about the vanilla play calling, but I, honestly, I think a lot of people aren't taking too much stock into that because they just do not want Atlanta to see what they're going to run at all come week one. They want to be as secretive as possible as far as that goes. Yeah, I think, you know, would remind people, this is not Frank Reich's first time being a head coach. I mean, he comes in from uh, the Colts and obviously other experiences like Philadelphia and so forth and played quarterback in this league for 14 years. He knows what it takes to get ready for regular season football as a player, as a coordinator, as a positions coach, and as a head coach. So I'm not concerned about any of that. And yeah, it's a veteran staff. I do think they need time, just like players do. I think they need to all gel together. You know, Thomas Brown has been sharing some of the play calling duties and it's going to be Frank Reich in the regular season. Uh, but he's, he mentioned his long-term plan. Frank said that uh, Thomas Brown will be the will be the play caller. So I think that'll be something developing, uh, if not this year, the next year. Um, and then obviously with the three, four from the four, three with the Jero Avero, you know, everyone views him also as being a future head coach in this league as far as his personality, his his pedigree. Uh, uh, I think that that could happen for him if this defense really balls out this year. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, we know Dom Capers, we know Jim Caldwell. These are consultant type guys who've been around for decades and decades that just add another brain to bounce ideas off of and that, and that kind of stuff. But you mentioned the offensive line, you know, James Camp and clearly one of the most respected offensive line coaches in this league. And we saw what he did after the first preseason game, calling his unit together, talking to them right as they exited the field before they even went into their team meeting. And Frank Reich didn't even know he was going to do that. I mean, it just shows you just, uh, just the amount of uh, impact and power these assistants have. And yeah. they're, they're not a bunch of yes men. I mean, this is not Frank didn't hire a bunch of guys who just think like him and say, yeah, boss, and and don't want to you know be on his bad side. Everybody's bringing different opinions and uh, it's good. I don't think they're, they're like, you know, like things like where they're like battling each other. But I think it's just good to hear sounding boards. Guys come from different systems, have different ideas. Josh McCown is new to coaching, but played 16 years in this league. He brings the different temperament, different set of eyeballs uh, at the quarterback position than anybody else would bring to. Yeah. And, and Deuce Staley, I think, is one of the more underrated uh, hires as well. We uh, mm -hmm. got him from the Lions, who we happened to play this week. So I'm sure right. that would be a good game for him to um, right. see those faces. Um, so let's go to that game. What to watch for on offense and then defense side of the ball uh, this week versus the Lions in the preseason finale? Yeah, I think um, – be a lot of the uh, same amount of time they spent with the starters previously. So, you know, depending how the series go, two to three series, you know, probably two if they if they do something good. So, I think if they have a really good series, it could be one. So, I think this is just a tune up. A lot of teams, the Lions have not been playing their starters in the preseason, so I don't know if that's going to change at all. But uh, Coach Campbell's not been playing his starters, so I think it's a good chance just to get some work in there with the ones that are going to play. I don't think Miles Sanders will play again. You just want to make sure he's healthy for the regular season. He's been back practicing fully at practice this week. Um, so just try to get some tempo. Just try to you know feel good. And then they get 16 days off after this. So it's like that's when even more work's going to happen. You know, the, the roster cut down will happen. Uh, they'll have 16 days in between this game and then the first regular season game. So there's plenty of time to still get some work in. So regardless of what happens in this preseason game, you know, the work continues. It just won't be under the the, the eyeballs of the lights of a preseason game, but uh, I, I think they'll be ready come week one. Yeah. Well, uh, Jim, you've been great before we uh, do some predictions. We'll get you out of here. Um, let's talk about um, the schedule a little bit and uh, the, some players that you've seen. Uh, give me a few players that are stock up and a few players that, um, you know, I, I, we won't say stock down. We'll be kind out here. We'll say uh, maybe needs a good final preseason game to either <laughs> make this roster or might be, um, still make the roster, but their role might have been a little bit more diminished. I think, you know, receiver's been all over the place. I think, you know, Shai Smith is clearly on the bubble at, at receiver. Uh, Demir Bird's injury might uh, give him a little bit more space to, to maybe make this team. But I think, you know, receiver, they've had some really good depth there. Um, you know, D Derek Wright at times has done some good things, but he's got to be healthy. He might be more practice squad kind of a guy. So I think there are some spots there. Uh, we know LaVisca Chenault now is in concussion protocol. I think, you know, LaVisca probably – makes the team, but uh, I, I wouldn't say hundred uh, percent LaVisca Chenault, but uh, I think he's, you know, someone they're interested in that they can use in multiple ways. But if somebody emerges, you know, somebody's going to be, you know, having to take a spot there. I think for somebody like uh, you know, Camus Grugier Hill, 
I mean, this was not a guy that at the start of training camp was being talked about a lot, but I think he may have earned himself a, a spot just because of the impact big plays that he's made uh, throughout the practices with the interceptions. I mean, you want guys like that. You know, Frankie Lubu was that way. You know, a guy that uh, was special teams and, and more of a backup player who's now got a contract. He plays as a starter. You know, Grugier Hill has been around the league for a little bit, but he's basic, basically viewed as a special teams player. I think depth-wise, you know, that that's somebody that could really help this team at the linebacker position. So those are just a couple. I, Eric Rose, interesting. They brought him in as a veteran guy, and I think maybe some younger guys might be challenging him. I think you have to keep Sam Franklin. He's such a good special teams player. So when you look yeah, at safety yeah. depth, I think Eric Rowe will be uh, one that's kind of down to the wire as far as what they might be looking at. And uh, he was involved, obviously, in that long touchdown uh, last week uh, with Hyatt. So um, we'll see on some of those. But there's some tough decisions. And once they make those decisions, I will promise you, they'll be scanning that waiver wire of the 31 other teams. And there'll probably be some more changes even after they make their cut down to 53. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good insight. Good to know. Um, real quick on the schedule at the, obviously they say it's a one game at a time season, which uh, I know the players and the coaches are trained that way. A lot of fans look at it, I, I believe in quarters, we like to say. So first four games are at Atlanta, new Orleans at Seattle, and then Minnesota at home, two division games to start. Um, what would you say is, um, uh, the most, I mean, obviously everyone want, want to want to start for now. We know that, but what is the best early outcome for this team finding their footing, a team who has replaced their head coach, their quarterback, a uh, retooled their wide receiver room, and also switched to the three, four on defense. Uh, what is kind of that best case scenario, um, for this team out at, in this first four games? Um, I think, you know, just in general, not putting a, a number value on it, it sure. it's, you know, win while you're learning. You know, yeah. it's like this is a team that's that's growing and learning around a rookie quarterback, but he's got veteran talent all around him on the offensive side. Defensively, a lot of guys like Brian Burns, Justin Houston have been in this league for a long time. Derek Brown, a veteran now. So I'm Jeremy Chin. So I think this team is like, you know, the training wheels are off. I think you can win while learning with this coaching staff. And as we all know, the NFC South, there's, there's nobody that stands out. So I shouldn't be concerned about Atlanta. Shouldn't be concerned about New Orleans being any better than the Panthers are, uh, despite everything being put together at this point. So ideally, yeah, you you do want to win every game, of course, but to, to win while learning in general, just as the whole season goes on, uh, it's one thing to make progress. It's another thing to also win games. And this NFC South is the American League Central of the NFL. Just be the Minnesota <laughs> Twins, man. Just, just beat the Guardians and the Tigers and you can win the division. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm exactly. looking at. Exactly. Um, well, Jim, like I said, this has been such a great uh, time for our listeners. I'm sure they're going to enjoy this podcast. Let's um, get into some predictions and we'll get you out of here. So uh, number one, um, just give me the player or the topic that just kind of comes to your mind based on uh, on the question. Um, player who takes the biggest leap this season. Player that takes the biggest leap this season. I'm going to say Jonathan Mingo. I think he's going to start out being a guy that they're going to rely on the veterans, first of all. But I think as the season goes on, I think Jonathan Mingo, they drafted him high in the second round. He's their guy. I think him and Bryce will have a chemistry. So I think as the season goes on from where we're sitting today, I think Jonathan Mingo will have a huge impact on this offense by the end. I'll say Derek Brown. I think the 3-4 defense is going to help him out a lot. Yeah, good call. Another step. Um, who is going to be the biggest uh, – you might have you might have a different answer. Who is going to be the – our offensive difference maker this year when Bryce Young needs that critical third down or when we need a uh, red zone trip caught in the end zone or run for a touchdown who's that that guy I think yeah this is what they've been lacking is the tight end position we haven't talked a lot about it during these 20 minutes or so but Hayden Hurst I think is brought in for that reason and as long as he stays healthy I mean really the only thing that's been holding back Hayden Hurst has been health uh, and that's what's probably led to him bouncing around the league a little bit but that's what you think about we think about red zone third down mismatches with linebackers that they've not used when they had the previous coaching regime here. So I, I would think Hayden Hurst would be a big impact guy in that, in that category. And then finally switching to the defensive side of the ball uh, outside of Brian Burns, who steps up on defense this year as the most consistent player. You know, Jeremy Chin, I'm excited to see what he's going to do. I think the fans are going to love Von Bell. I think he might be that kind of sledgehammer that uh, was in the secondary when we've had, some other past units, uh, thinking like Malcolm McCree and some guys going back through the years. Um, I think you had a big hit. I mean, if you think about that, that awful first drive against the Giants last week, it was eight out of nine. The one that was incomplete was Von Bell dislodging yep, the ball from that. the receiver. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the physical impact he could have on this team. So I think Von Bell, he's been, I think, five years in the league now coming on board. 
big hitting guy out of Ohio State and with the Saints. I, I think Von Bell could be a difference maker on the defensive secondary side as a physical player that they haven't had in that presence for a while. That's a good one. I'm going to go with Frankie Louvu. Um, and then on offense, my previous question, I'm going to go with Hayden Hurst as well. Uh, does our D finish in the top five or the top 10 when it's all said and done? I think your know, top 10 is reasonable. I think, you know, being a first year system and bringing everybody together and top 10 is a great compliment out of 32. So would love to say top five and maybe they, they can do that. That would obviously blow everybody's minds, but I think it's got the ability to be, to be, to be top 10, but I think there's going to be just, you know, you look at that first game against the jets. And again, then we're talking about backup players by and large, but you know, a couple of tight ends left open in the end zone. So sometimes there's missed assignments and things that happen when you're new to something. I think as it becomes more second nature, uh, this will be a more complete defense. So I'll I'll take top 10 out of those two. Um, and, and then last two, I know you're going to probably, you know more than you might tell me. Um, so we'll just say yes or no. Uh, Brian Burns, new contract uh, signed and dotted on the line by September 11th. Yes or no? That's the goal. I know that the, you know Scott Fitter has outwardly said, you know, they, 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 they're keeping Brian Burns here. Brian Burns wants to be here. So whatever the date on the calendar is, I don't know, but I think Brian Burns will be a Panther for a long time. And then uh, season prediction, I know some guys don't do that. So if you choose not to do that, I will not hold it against you. I'll give you mine instead. But uh, what is your record for the Panthers this season? If you had to put a number on it. If I had to, I'd have to go 17-0 and because I'm a Panthers announcer. So I never do a game where I don't think they're going to win, just like a coach or a player wouldn't go into a game thinking they can't win. So, yeah, that's one of those. Um, uh, it's, the odds are, are slight that they'll go 17-0. and 0, I'll put it that way. But uh, that would be my my call. I can't put a number on it other than that. But I do think they can play just in general, like I said, well enough to make the playoffs, to win the division. I think division is their best route. But, uh, yeah, I can't give you a number. So I'll have to listen to you, Ryan. What, what's your number? Nine and eight is my okay. uh, prediction. Uh, first or second in the South, I haven't decided yet. Um, wild card, obviously, if we finish second, and then obviously division winner if we finish first. So, um, well, Jim, this has been great. As I said at the top, uh, my guest today has been Jim Zoki, uh, Panthers Radio Network uh, color commentator uh, and WBT Radio Hall of Famer. Uh, Jim, thanks for coming on Inside the Vault, a Carolina Panthers podcast, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Ryan. And that'll wrap up this edition of the Inside the Vault Carolina Panthers podcast. My name is Ryan Smith. Again, you could rate, subscribe to the Tobacco Road Sports YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tobacco radio. We'll see you next time.